Uh, we've got our online congregation with us today. So when I count to three, would you guys lose your minds for them? One, two, three. Welcome our online people. We love you guys. We are so glad that you're with us at church this morning and you're a part of us, part of our church. Um, let's start off this new series right. Um, we're, ta we're talking about Limitless God. We're going to do this series for two weeks, Limitless God, because our God has no limits. Amen? God has no limits. So um, in the Harry Potter series, um, hopefully that doesn't freak you out that I'm talking about that. In the Harry Potter series, there is a family in there named the Weasleys. Do you know the Weasleys? Um, they all have red hair, and my daughter Davy had red hair, so these guys were special to us. Um, so Molly Weasley was the head of that family, and, and if you ever went to her house, her house was going to be a bit of a mess. Not really put together, um, but man, there was going to be a lot of food. And whether you were expected or not, you were welcome at the Weasley's house, and you were going to have a great time. There was going to be not only food, but there was going to be too much food, amen? How many of you like too much food, right? Like, there's going to be too much food. There was going to be so much food that there was going to be no stress. There was going to be no rationing, like people stuffing food in their pockets, like I got the really good hors d'oeuvre, so I'm going to save some for later. There was going to be none of that. And if you walked in and you were not expected that day, nobody was going to look at you stressed. Now, when I watch that all unfold, I think of Terry Trueblood, my mom, because that's the way it always was. Do you have anybody in your life who you grew up with who threw parties like that with way too much food? Anybody? Can you think of their name right now? Tell the person next to you what their name is. Who was that way? All right, Terry Trueblood was going to have two, at least two, maybe three meat dishes. There were going to be breads. There were going to be rolls. Amen? Rolls. There was going to be vegetables and dips, multiple dips, not mayonnaise-based because that's of the devil. It's going to be sour cream, <laughs> sour cream-based dips. Eight flavors at least of sodas. It was not going to be sweet tea. It was going to be unsweet tea because I'm a northern boy. Three kinds of potatoes, at least. Definitely going to be all gratins in there somewhere. Four to six desserts. Are you hungry yet? Just this overabundance of food that you are going to walk into, and it changes things. Here's what's interesting about the story, too. And, and, and think about the person that you were just naming a second ago. See, my mom was a single mom. We didn't have a whole lot of money. The Weasleys in the story, they're the poor family in the story. Why is it that sometimes when somebody doesn't have a whole lot of money, they can be the most generous person you've ever seen? Isn't that true? I would say part of the reason for that is because generosity doesn't have anything to do with how many resources you have. It has everything to do with a mindset. It has everything to do with what's in your heart. Generosity is a heart stance and sometimes our heart stance can be more generous the less we have which is very very interesting let's talk about God for a second our God is a limitless God our God is a generous God so let's dive into Psalm chapter 50. I want you to see what he says here. It's, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing the way that he puts this. This is verse 8. God says to his people, I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings which are ever before me. What God's saying is, hey, I love my church. You guys bring the kind of offerings that you need to bring. I don't have an issue with you as far as the offerings that you're bringing to church. But he says in verse 9, I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine. All the insects in the fields are mine. Some of you guys grew up with Bible versions that said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Do you remember that phrasing? God says, it's great that you're bringing gifts into church, but just so we're clear, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Just so we're clear, I'm God, and I've got everything I need already. Verse 12, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? God's saying, hey, I'm not hungry. Like, you can bring your gifts, and you can be generous people, but it's not because God is needy. Your God is not needy. He is limitless. 
he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? Acts 17, 25. Nor is he served by human hands, as if he needed anything, there it is again, because he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So not only is God limitless, but this second verse says he wants to pass his limitlessness on to you. I know that's not gra grammatically correct, but he wants to pass it on to you. He wants that heart, he wants that attitude to be in his people. See, giving, the point of giving is not, I'm going to take a risk on this, it's not for God. God intends your giving for you. He wants to change you. See, this world is a broken place, and we know this, but part of the brokenness of this world is that we have a scarcity mentality. We have a never enough mentality. Now, have you been to those parties? Have you been to the parties where everything is just so, and there's only so much food, and you better RSVP ahead of time, and if you bring a buddy that was not expected, you look over at the host, and they've got stress on their face. That's, that's stress, and it's control, and it's rationing, and, and I'm, I'm not sure what we're going to do, and, and, and you don't relax at a party like that. You don't release, and you don't... You don't just get to focus on people. You're focused on what's going on in the organization. And are we going to be okay? And the worries kind of take over. And that's the other side. The never enough mentality or the limitless mentality. And you're like, wait a second though. Resources aren't actually limitless. I know, right? They're not actually limitless. But God calls us often. And if you're going to be a generous person, you're going to have to see things this way as if they're limitless. As if they're limitless is a faith choice that God will be there behind you. As if there's no limit to money, as if there's no limit to love, as if there's no limit to your time, as if there's no limit to how many rooms your household can ho hold, right? These are the things. The never enough party is no fun. So God wanted to show us how his limitless kind of came over into our world. And so he shows it to us all through the scriptures. And I'm going to give you an example of one space where he does this because it's so, so clear. Um, the children of Israel were in slavery in Egypt. Do you remember that in the book of Exodus? And Moses comes and like, you know, Charlton Heston with the big tablets and uh, that whole thing. And it's wonderful, right? But like when they're in slavery in Egypt, there's a never enough mentality that's there. And they wrestle with it. They struggle with it. And God has to prove to them that it's not real. So here's how their slavery was. Number one, never enough. There's not enough military might for us to get an entire nation to get freed up from Egypt. Egypt was a military power. They were the chief superpower in the world, in the ancient world at that time. How in the world were the people of Israel going to get free from them? They weren't. They didn't have the military might. Also, there was no way for them to get free, to convince Pharaoh to let them go. And then finally, even if they left, they were going to be absolutely poor in the desert because they had nothing. They were slaves. So here comes a limitless God. He comes in with the plagues and with his miracles, and he frees the Israelites with not a single battle. Think about the story. There was not one military battle between the people and Pharaoh's army. Pharaoh's army, actually, even when he decide, decided to rally the army and come out with his, his horses and chariots and all that kind of stuff, God just took care of him in the Red Sea. Also, the miracles themselves compelled Egypt to let them go. Not a single Israelite soldier was hurt or was killed in the entire exercise. And then finally, God restored their wealth because that's what a limitless God does. Once his plagues had come upon Egypt, this weird thing happened. This weird thing happened where the, the Egyptians wanted to be rid of them so much. God said, why don't you, on your way out of the country, ask them for all the gold and silver that they have? And people just gave them everything. As long as you're leaving, you can have anything that you want. And that's how God restored their wealth. Now look at them in the desert. Once they got into the desert, 
their troubles weren't over, and you guys know this, they had no food, they had no bread, they had no meat, and they had no water. There's not enough. They're worried. They're afraid. They begin to complain to God. They struggle with their faith. Then our limitless God comes in, gives them daily manna, daily quail, water from the rock. Do you remember these stories? Do you see how God's coming in and saying, you've got to see me as a limitless God. You've got to interact with me by faith and see me this way. Now go to Jesus. Do you remember when there was 5,000 hungry people? (laughs) And there's not enough. You know how many times people in the scripture concluded that there wasn't enough? 5,000 hungry people, there's only five loaves and two fish. And then you got some possessive disciples sitting there. And what are they doing? They're eyeing that bread and, and those fish, and they're hoping it's for them. They're hoping these people will all leave and go find their own dinner. Because this is all they can see right in front of them. And they don't approach the entire thing by faith, if you know the story well. Instead, they say, Jesus, would you send the people away so that they can take care of themselves? And they're staring at this food, and they're hoping that it's for them. And they're not sure how they'll even get a meal out of all of this. What are they going to do? They're going to ration it, and they're going to try and spread it out and make it work for 12 disciples. It was never going to work. Low faith. Limitless God comes in. It's a miraculous feeding. And not only is everybody fed by the power of Jesus because he is limitless, but there are 12 baskets left over in the story. And the number 12 is not a mistake. And it is not random. It's right at those possessive disciples saying, no, if you take care of God's people, you will be taken care of at the end. Because a limitless God is always going to take care of the giver as well as the recipient. And so the disciples, they walk through that entire thing with a new faith. Because that's the way God does it. Not only are people's needs going to be taken care of, but you're going to grow. Because they grew as a result. There was a time I was in college and, and one of my pastors, his name was Bill, um, he, he was discipling me. He was, he was training me in the faith and showing me how to walk with Jesus. And we went to this little conference, and there were some missionaries that were there. And I was wearing this sweatshirt. It was this college sweatshirt. And I had had a part-time job in college, okay? And, like, I had bought it myself. I was super proud of this sweatshirt. And I was there, and one of the missionaries around my age, he sees my sweatshirt. He's like, that's a really great sweatshirt. <clears throat> and I think nothing of it. And then Bill comes walking over to me, and he's like, I'd like you to give that guy your sweatshirt. I don't want to give him my sweatshirt. It's like, I want you to give him your sweatshirt. And he's like, but here's the thing. If you give him your sweatshirt, I'm going to give you enough money to buy yourself a replacement sweatshirt that's exactly like what you have. And... It was weird and okay, and so I went and gave the guy my sweatshirt. And and then Bill comes, and he pays for a new one. And why would you do that? And he's like, I wanted to teach you that if ever you give to someone in need, God will give back to you. God will always have you. That's why, that's why when you're at the good party and they're living as if there's no limit to the resources, everybody's having a great time. As if there's no limit. As if God's right there with us and is going to take care of us no matter what we do. Does that make sense? You're like, well, that's complicated. I know, it's totally complicated. Look at Luke 6.38. It says, give and you will receive, and your gift will return to you in full. Pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. And the amount that you give will determine the amount that you give back. That's a scary verse to read in church. Why? Because some of you, that verse was first read to you by a televangelist or somebody else who was using a verse like this to coerce you to give to them. 
And what they were doing is they were utilizing this as some kind of a sales technique. That if I can get you to give to me, God's going to give more money back to you. And you're going to have houses and yachts and... Right? You've heard this pitch. And abuses have been done and things have been wrong. Can I just say that? I'm just going to own that on behalf of the church. Those were not good moments in the church that you were a part of. That's an abuse of a verse like this. What God is saying is, hey, listen, if you give generously, I'm limitless and I'm behind you and I'm going to make sure you're going to be okay. Give the sweatshirt away. I'll get you a new sweatshirt in my way and in my time. Right, Like I'm going to come in and I'm going to make sure your deepest needs are taken care of in my way and in my time. What the televangelists try to tell you is that it was going to come back immediately as money. No, it's not what he says necessarily. And it's not what we experience. And then we get confused and our hearts get broken and we wonder whether or not God actually fulfills his promises to us. Some of you guys have gone all the way down that road. What God's saying is, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. And I want you to live in this way that you're not rationing your resources and always worried about giving away too much, but that instead you live as a generous person. Because, man, that'll change you. God's saying, trust me. Look at this verses, Proverbs 30. Love this. This talks about the fact that money can be hard on us. He says this, first, help me never to to tell a lie, God. Love that. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. This is a blue-collar prayer, isn't it? God, make me middle class. That's what he says right here. He says, I don't want to be poor, and I don't want to be rich either. Why is he saying this? Why is this the wisdom of Proverbs? Because he says, verse 9, for if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and insult God's holy name. So let's deal with the poverty part really quick. That's one extreme, right? He's saying, listen, I don't want to live there because there's a whole set of struggles with being a poor person and not feeling like you have enough. But on the flip side, just like there's spiritual danger here, there's also spiritual danger in wealth. There's also spiritual danger in having so much. And what he says that you, you wake up one day and you say, who is the Lord? What's he saying? He's saying, I don't need God anymore. I got everything taken care of. My 401k is solid. Right? Like I, I achieved the degree. I got the title that I always wanted. All the mouths are fed. And I can wake up and I can say, who needs to go to church? Who needs God? I got me, right? Like I didn't do just, I didn't just do strong things in my life or smart things in my life. I am strong. I am smart. And once I start talking like that, I got me and I got me here and I'll get me there. And there's a self-reliance that starts to come in and a false security That's super, super dangerous. Because, man, your 401ks may be solid, but your 401ks will not protect you on the day of cancer. They will not comfort you on the day of divorce. They will not heal you from that betrayal. There are so many things that will reduce you yet again that your money cannot solve. And so there's danger there. Does that mean money is bad? No, it doesn't mean money's bad. Money's good. Praise God. Money's good. Thank you, God, for the blessings that you give us. I'm not going to talk bad about money, but if we're not careful, it can be dangerous for us. And that's what he's saying in the proverb there, because it can pull you away from God. Money can also be addictive to you. That's a weird word, isn't it? Addictive. Well, what does that mean? It means means that even when I feel the thrill and the joy from a thing, If all it does is make me want ever more of it and I'm never, ever satisfied, that's an addiction, right? Like I have to keep feeding the monster 
as it gets bigger in my life and demanding more from my life, and, and there's no end in sight ever. That's, that's the nature of addiction. Can money be that way? Yeah. Yeah. Because were you satisfied with your life when you were 21? And are you less or more satisfied today? I mean, just depending on where you're at. It can could, it could mess with this, right? Like, here's a graph. We're going to have fun with graphs this morning. No math must be done for this next section. But let's do fun with graphs. Um, here's a graph. Um, here's kind of what we think when we start out our, our adult lives, right? Like, I'm going to spend a certain amount of money, and I'm going to make a certain amount of money, and I'm going to spend a little bit less than that up until a point, right? Up until the point where I reach what I need. Because right now at this stage in my life, I don't have enough money coming in to really meet all of my needs. But when that day comes, oh man, I'm not just going to keep spending. I'm going to spend a whole lot less. And what's going to be in the middle? Everything I give away. When that day comes, I'm going to be this amazingly generous person. Is that what happens? No. No. What really happens? Here's the next graph, final graph. That's what happens. To all of us, right? Like, I remember when Linda and I first got married, and we're staying in this little one-bedroom apartment, and, you know, we're in Illinois, and there's this, like, sliding glass door in the in, in the. I, I, I want to say living room like there were any other rooms. There weren't. Um, but there's a sliding glass door. And I remember when it snowed outside and snow like came into the living room. Like we had a patch of snow in there because it didn't st- seal so well. Um, we were so happy though. We were having a great time. I mean, you should have seen this kitchen and the ugly colors, 1970s stuff that they put together. It's probably back in style now, but it looked horrible then. But it's like... But you start there, and you're like, everything's fine. And then we, all we got to do is we just got to get to that first house. And if we could just get to that first house, and then you get into that first house. And what do you do? Well, you come into that neighborhood for the first time, and it's like you see people driving around you, and you see the fancy cars that they're in, and you're in this beater car, you know what I mean? And, and, and you're like, these people are rich. But that's how it feels on day one. Because then what you start to do is you, you start to say, well, I'm going to start buying some clothes that look like their clothes. And I, maybe one day I'm going to buy a car that looks kind of like their cars. And my kids are going to go to schools like theirs. And, and my backyard's going to look kind of like theirs. And, and that guy's got that grill. I want that grill too. And it happens really, really gradually, right? And what you do is you, like, you, you move up to what that house in that neighborhood is. And then you get a promotion at work and you get a raise and you move to another house and you pull into that neighborhood for the first time. You're like, man, these people are rich. And then you gradually move up. Don't we do that? And we do that so many times that we get to my age, my advanced age. (laughs) You look back and you're like, man, I thought I was going to be way more of a generous person than I actually am. And what happened? But this culture just got me. The culture just got me. It just, it just I kind of got caught up in it. The way that we all get caught up in it. And it's like, it's, it's not judgment. It's, no, it's nothing like that. It's just, is it really making us happy? Is it making us more generous people? Is it a limitless situation? Or does it feel more like never enough? Because I think it feels more like never enough. If we're honest. With ourselves. I think there are fears that are underneath it that keep us spending and keep us hoarding the way that we do. And we wonder if God can take care of us. Will He really bring His limitless nature into our life if we trust Him? It's hard to trust Him. And there are fears that grab us like, <clears throat> If I give one of my five TVs away, will we really be okay? (laughs) And first service laughed at that one too. But what's tough is when you say, if I give one of these cars away, will we really be okay? Because that's harder. 
And I know people who've given cars away. And they had to change up how the kids were getting to school and how all the driving was going to happen in order to do the whole world, the whole, the whole thing with fewer cars. And it was, it was an adjustment. It was hard. But they made that choice. And I think, I think when you make a choice like that, you're more free than others. Don't you think? More free. But we fear it. God, can you really take care of us fully with fewer possessions? Like maybe you're a financial security person and you like to put the money away for a rainy day and you're thinking about your 401k and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, God, could you really take care of us if I've got less money in that 401k? What if I give some of it away? What if you lead me one day to really be sacrificial and to give some of this? What's going to happen to us? Are we going to be able to have that summer home? Are we going to be able to be secure? Will people look at me like I'm a bad planner? What if I have to take a part-time job? How will people look at me then? Will they say, well, you, you didn't prepare very well. And, and, and what's underneath maybe some of my possessiveness isn't just possessiveness, it's pride. Right? But what are the things that God wants you to be free of? And maybe it's not security. Maybe it's, maybe it's your spending, your freedom to spend. God, will you really take care of me in the midst of my financial freedom? Because I don't want the 401k. What I want to do is I want to be able to go out to dinner whenever I want to. And I want to go on vacation with my family. And I want to bless them. And I want to have great memories. And I want to have a great time. And I want to do all of these things. And if I can't have that freedom, it starts to make me feel like the poor kid who grew up in a poor family. And I was never going to be that kid again. Instead, I was going to be the person who could make choices. And now you're giving up that freedom. And we're back to pride again. And we're back to trust again. Do you see that there's things underneath? And the things that are underneath are not they're things that have bound us up, actually. They're not things that are good. And do you think your kids growing up in your house are smart enough to see through all that? Because I think they are. It's hard. And if I don't have that freedom to spend on those things, will I be able to give my kids the, the, the special coaches and the educational opportunities and the stylistic clothes and, and the devices and all the things that they want? And if I can't give them all the things that they want, will my kids grow up hating me? because I didn't provide all the stuff that they wanted? Is that really what your kids want from you? Or would it be better that they grow up around a generous parent and that generosity would actually be in the home? And would that actually change things? God's ways are higher than our ways. And there's things he wants to set, set, set us free from. It's the same thing in your time. I can't give away my time. I can't give away my time because there won't be enough time. Do you hear the never enough? I don't know that I can trust God to make, make all the things that get done that need to get done. If I, if I become a Bible study leader or I become a small group leader or I become a, a little league coach or help out in the community, if I do any of those things, like sometimes there's volunteer opportunities around a church or around a community, and, and that's where your mind goes. It goes to your schedule, and it's like I can't give up that much of my space. That's a never enough. What about your limitless God? Is it possible that he could come into your schedule and make things work if you would heed his call and be a generous person with your time? Would you look back, you know, 10 years later and look back and say, this is the stuff I did that actually had value. I think you would. What about, what about space? Am, am I afraid that, oh God, I can't give too much love away. I can't have this many friends. I can't bring extra kids into my home. I won't have enough love left over. Will you, though? Will the math change? Because I think maybe the math will change. And I think maybe God, being a limitless God, could get you through some of these things. And maybe you would come out stronger as a result. I desperately want to hand down a different spirit to my kids. I desperately want my grandkids to know what generosity looks like. God wants you free. Look, Luke 3.11. John replied, this is John the Baptist is talking. He says, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. 
I love that John in this passage doesn't say, give both your shirts away, walk around naked, praise God. <laughs> it's not what he calls us to. You know what I mean? You got to give till it hurts. You know, it's like, it's no. Just be a generous person. But even that, like to give one of those shirts away, it's a stretch, right? Like it sounds silly in America where we've got like 50 shirts in our closet. But it's like, he's like, give one of them away. It's like, well, God, what if I get a rip in the one that I kept? What if there's a coffee stain? What if it falls out of style? I'm going to wish I still had that shirt back. <laughs> Trust your limitless God. That's what he's talking about. Because that never enough thinking, it's killing you. There were times that... Um, Linda and I gave to missionaries. We gave to Compassion Kids. You know, you write those once a month checks and you make those commitments. And we gave a percentage to our church from the very first day that we got married. It was easy for us. We didn't spend five years and fall into a bunch of debt. And then you're trying to climb out and figure out how to give to your church. All that stuff gets really complex and should all be talked about. Um, we kind of had it easy. We just started in a place and then we just kind of consistently gave. And I look back on it. And part of what's wonderful about that is, is we, we lived way below our means. And we kind, of, we kind of created a spot where it's like that's for God. And we could have had a better house but we didn't. And I, I love that choice. Going into eternity, I love that choice. I don't regret it at all. It's a wonderful thing. And there were times that we, we weren't faithful. There were times that we had to stop because we lost jobs and stuff like that. And some of you guys have been through those things. But I thank God. There's something about building generosity into your life that starts to set you free from the things that bind you. We just came away from 21 days of prayer and fasting. And there were a few food items that I didn't eat during that time. Like Doritos. I didn't eat any Doritos. <laughs> but there's something about, like, you go into the first few days of a fast. If you've ever done this before, I highly recommend it. But it's like, if you go with the first few days into a fast like that, like, you have a lot of hunger pains. Like, your body starts screaming at you and demanding. It's like, hey! You gave me these things before. How dare you? And you can hear its voice, right? Easy to interpret. But man, you make it through a fast and you come out the other side. And do you know what starts to occur to you? I don't have to obey every voice. My hunger pains, my appetites, some of my appetites should not be obeyed. And I have the ability to say no. And that's in every area of your life. And I walk away, man, just fired up about that idea. And it's like, I can say no to things. And it feels like I've been freed and power came back. It's the same thing with generosity. God's giving you steps to take that sets you free. He's not just saying be free. He's giving you steps to take that if you'll take them and trust him, you'll lead a limitless life. I believe that. Now, I talked about some, so, some things that we gave. There was a night that Linda picked up a hi hitchhiker. This is for real. <laughs> and we were young, and we were in a rental place, and she picked this guy up, and, and, and she felt bad for him and wanted him to have a place to stay overnight. And she brought him home, and she called me at work, and she's like, I picked this guy up, and I drove so fast home. <laughs> like, I probably broke <laughs> some laws. Um, but I got there, and it's like, and we met this guy, and, and, and we fed him dinner that night, and, and he stayed in our bed, and we, we were out, out in the other room, and, and, and um, he, tried to, uh, he tried to convert us to Islam that night. It was a whole thing. Um, but it was like, but it was wonderful. It was wonderful because I'm sitting here, I'm looking at my wife, and it's like, okay, this is all messy. I don't know I'd ever do anything like this again. But look at the generosity of my wife. Like she's willing to create space for somebody and she's willing to go out of the bounds of what seem like the rules sometimes. And there's something very Jesus in all of this. 
And it's like, there's just some things that we've done in our lives. But I'll be real with you. Like, as soon as I see another family that's brought a foster kid into their home, I realize I'm a lightweight on generosity compared to those people. Or anybody that adopts and they make a lifelong commitment to another child to both love them and give them space and pay for them and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm a lightweight compared to them. There's another guy named Dennis um, who I've, I've gotten to know over the years, owned his own uh, travel agency company, and, and he got involved in missions, and I'm a lightweight compared to Dennis. Dennis got to know some missionaries down in the Amazon River Basin, and he realized that they needed money and they needed technology to bring clean water filters to villages in the Amazon River, River Basin. And so he funded all of it, and he was traveling down there multiple times a year to make, th make sure things went forward. And then he started to realize once they had a good filter in place and they were taking it to some of these villages, he realized that there were certain dry seasons in the Amazon River Basin where they couldn't get the boats through because it was too shallow. So then he started meeting with some boat builders down there, and they designed a whole boat with special kind of like, like lightweight aluminum, and they got a Caterpillar engine into it so that they could get water filters into the deep parts of the Amazon River Basin. And this guy gave his life to it. Does that inspire you? I mean, I couldn't even quantify what he gave out of himself. Give yourself away. Give yourself away. Now I talk about all of this stuff, and here's part of the thing. It starts to come into your mind just a little bit. It's like, oh boy, where's the pledge cards, Pastor? We're talking about money in church. Where's the presentation? There is none. There are no pledge cards. There just aren't. I don't like to talk about this topic. I don't ever like to talk about this topic in church. Because I know some of you guys have been burned in the church by selfish pastors who are trying to build buildings and build empires and all of that kind of stuff. I know. And because of that, and I know it's complicated and complex, I just often like to stay away from it. Our church elders kind of twisted my arm to do this series. But part of the reason we needed to do a series on generosity it's because we don't talk about it enough and many of us are bound up in this. But also, what's wonderful about now to talk about this is our church is in great shape financially, if I could just tell you that. Last year, we had the greatest giving year in the history of this church. We asked you guys for a certain amount of money to build that gym over there, and you gave us way more than what we asked for. So it's like we're in a spot right now where we're not needy. And so there's no ulterior motive that you've got to be concerned about with this. And not only that, but I just want to tell you, next week, our second week, we're actually going to drive right into the topic of giving to the church. And specifically, we are going to unpack everything that I, th I think you've seen abused over the years. And we're going to take it one question at a time, one topic at a time, and we're going to look at what the Bible actually says. So if you've seen some shady stuff and you're like, I'd like to know what this church actually believes about tithing or percentage giving, we're going to talk about it. We're going to go to all those verses. And maybe you don't want to come back next week. That's fine. That's totally fine, and I love you, and it's totally fine. But it's going to be another no-pressure week. It's all going to be about trying to correct some of the bad things that you've heard and tell you what the Bible really says. We're going to talk about paying pastors. We're going to talk about missions and how much should go to your local church versus foreign missions, how much should go to social justice. We're going to talk about all those complicated things. It's all going to be next week, so maybe come back. I think God wants you to bring generosity into your life. And I think he wants you to be less self-reliant. I think he wants to free you from all the fear. I think he wants to free you from greed. I think he wants to free you from all the things in our culture that bind us up. I think he wants to set you free. But there's one last thing that I think he wants for you when it comes to generosity. And this one's... This one's the most precious to me. 
So this is Matthew 25, verse 40. It says, and then the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you were doing it to me. And what Jesus is saying there is this is a picture of the, the final judgment. And he looks out across Christians and he says, there was a time when I was hungry and you brought me food. There was a time when I was naked and you're the one who brought me clothing. There was a time when I was sick and in the hospital and you came and visited me. There was a time that I was in prison and you came and saw me in prison. And the people that he's talking to in that passage, if you know it well, they're all like, we didn't recognize you, Jesus. We did that stuff to these other people. And Jesus says, he's like, whenever you did this stuff to these other people, you were generous to them. He's like, I was there. I was actually there. Spiritually, I inserted myself in that moment, and it was as if you were doing that to me. Someone was talking to Mother Teresa once. You know it's a good message if I'm quoting Mother Teresa, right? And she said to them, she said, whenever I meet someone in need, it's really Jesus in his most distressing disguise. It's him I help and him alone. Why say all that? Because Jesus Christ died for me and he gave me everything. Though he was rich, for us, he became poor and he walked away from it all so that through his poverty, we might become rich, the scripture says. He gave himself away entirely and what actually rises up in me, and I don't have to force myself into this, what actually rises up into me is that I want to give back to him. It's my greatest joy is to give back to him. You ever do five-year planning? You can look at five years of your life and say, what do I want to accomplish? What are my goals? And that's good. Ten-year planning. And then you look back on the previous five years and say, what did I accomplish? When I look back on the previous five years of my life, do you know what matters to me? It's not the stuff I bought. It's not even the vacations we had. It's where I gave myself away. For real. You, you might think, hey, you know, we're going to get to heaven one day and it's not going to be about our stuff. And you're totally right. But can I say this too? It's not going to be about how many trips you took to Florida. It won't. I'm sorry, but the new heavens and new earth are going to be better. Florida isn't that great comparatively. It just isn't. And you're like, yeah, but I need these memories and I need these experiences. And those things are good, but keep them in the right place. Because you, brothers and sisters, you are eternal. You are immortal. You are not done in this life. And our culture believes that and our culture is wrong. Your experience does not end at death. You go on, which means that the people that you know, you will continue to have experiences. You will continue to love. You will continue to make memories on into eternity. And you will not look back at this life and say, I missed out because I let death come like a finish line and I didn't get all the things done that I wanted to get done. No, you won't. No, you won't. The you that's there We'll look back on the you that's now and say, I wish I'd have given myself away. That's what you'll say. And you may not be there yet. And it's okay if you're not there yet. I'm speaking to those who are. I'm telling you what I believe is the truth. Can we pray? God, we love you so much. You're so good to us, God. I, I, I love that you were first the limitless God to us and that you've poured out your blessing into our life, God. I pray that you would come and change us and make us a generous people. Maybe we've just got some baby steps to take. And Lord, would you help us to take them? Help us to walk in faith toward you, to believe you. Change our homes, Lord, so that when our kids grow up, they take generosity with them so that when our grandkids come along, they'll take generosity with them. Lord, give us a legacy that's worth leaving behind. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name.